Okay, and we are live. Hello everybody and welcome to the May Bar Members Festival. So tonight there will be 21 performers each with differing monologues inspired by the future of our cities. So I hope that everybody watching enjoys and good luck to all the performers tonight. Hi, my name is Isabel. This monologue was inspired after experiencing for the first time in my life, a quiet London and dealing with the fact the world is speeding back up again. I think the birds are late today because I didn't hear them till seven and they're meant to start at six, which is when I wake up. So today feels like a day when I'm meant to be waiting. I've got a, um, a little of life on hold. Yesterday I felt like I was dangling by the tips of my fingers and the day before that I kept falling through the same levels of a New York fire escape. Sorry, um, is my signal okay? <laughs> I'm feeling on hold yet I can't get my internet to work. That's why I'm in my living room and not because my room's messy though it is, I decided because I'm currently not allowed to walk to my park for coffee I'll walk down my hallway for internet instead. I'm here waiting for the birds. That window there is open so I can listen out for them. <laughs> I feel weird telling you this over Zoom. I feel very super performative and kind of detached emotionally. Just I can't help but feel my stomach drop if I can't hear the birds. London's just really quiet currently and I worry about the future where everything picks back up again that I won't be able to hear the birds. It's so I know that time is working and I'm not being left behind. I am being propelled into the future with everyone else that if I'm with something as dull as a bird, at least I can continue. And if the birds are late, it means that this feeling as is meaningful and it's totally justified not to walk to my kitchen and turn the kettle on. If a mudane fucking pigeon can't get ready on time, if the whole city can't tie their shoelaces, why the hell should I? Hello, I'm Sophie. Um, this is a monologue sort of inspired by influencer culture and my thoughts. I didn't kill her. I just imagined it very, very vividly. And now, now you're laughing, but <laughs> don't laugh. That's very, that's, very, that's very condescending and I don't like being looked down upon. How many followers have you got? You can tell me. I am a vegan. No? Well, I'm an intern too. And um, at my internship, the boss wanted me to increase the followers of her theatre company by following 500 people a week and then unfollowing them all again on a Friday alongside scheduling four tweets a day. And <laughs> at first I was like, <sighs> but... You know what? The sad thing is it did actually really help her business grow. And I felt great one morning when I woke up to 11K. And if I am really honest, the whole reason that I took this internship was because I gave her a Google. I saw that she'd got 10K and I thought, oh, God, yeah, I should probably get involved in this as it would, it would look great on the CV. <laughs> Please don't tell her that, though, because I'd, I'd quite like my job back after this. That's not even the worst thing that I did, though. Do you want to know the worst thing that I did? You do. Well, the worst thing that I did was I followed all the people that I know or want to know so that when they find out that I'm doing an internship at this theatre, they'll be like, oh, my God, yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> I know that theatre. That I follow them on Twitter, congrats. And I'll be like, yeah, 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 no, thank you, no problem. And it's so shallow, but we're all doing it, aren't we? And 900 followers got me nowhere besides on antidepressants, so why not? Do you want me to take your picture? It could just be a selfie if you want. I, I really don't mind. No? See, actually, how is that not evidence in my favour? Because if you go back on all of my social media, Facebook, Instagram, tw maybe not Twitter, but... In this world where we Snapchat and hashtag and photograph everything, if I, you know, if I wanted, if I had, and I have, but if I had, 
would have at least gone on my Instagram story. Hi, I'm Rachel and um, this monologue that I've written is inspired by lockdown and um, relationship breakdowns in different households. We've been around a lot recently, like all the time. And I felt a bit lost, you know? I know it's not your fault, but it's just hard, isn't it? Things have been difficult. I mean, I know I'm to blame as well. At least I think I am. I just, I just thought we both agreed to make this work and give things a proper go. But these past six or seven months, something hasn't seemed right and we haven't been talking and it's been awkward. You've been away a lot and I get the whole work thing. I do, honestly, I really, really do. And you're tired and the last thing you want to do is stay up all night and watch some stupid Netflix series with me. But do you know what? I'm tired too. You don't, you don't help matters in the slightest. You can at least try to communicate with me, but you don't. And when you're here, you spend all your time on your phone. I didn't realise your phone was so much more interesting than me. What? You think I'm boring? <laughs> we don't have to stay here, you know? We, we could go out and actually talk to each other like normal people. Normal people. You know what that is? Talking. <laughs> Look. I'm, I'm tired, so tired and I'm tired of going around in circles every day and nothing ever changes with you, does it? I'm fed up with arguing with you all the time. I just, I just, you know, I can't breathe anymore. I can't live here anymore, not in this, this tiny house, in these tiny rooms, in these four walls. Not here, not in this city. Not, not with you, not with you. Hi, I'm Shelley and I wrote this monologue while being at work and just people watching. Do you ever feel like you're in a really bad episode of Black Mirror? Everything is so apocalyptic now, Charlie Brooker can even write this shit. Does it scare you when you think about the future of 2020? Well, it scares me. I could be at work pouring a pint as I do and then suddenly it dawns on me. Then I realise that I've accidentally over poured a pint of Guinness and now my cousins are either mad or laughing at me. There's never an in-between. I see so many people come in and come out of our restaurant, some wearing masks and others who would much rather fight the idea You'd probably catch those people in anti-mask protests in Trafalgar Square. Huh. So this is the new norm, huh? The new norm. What a weird, what a weird phrase. Because this isn't normal. And I don't think we ever will be. You're lucky though. You're still on furlough. You get to stay away from people and the mess that they can bring. Yeah. I get it. You should still go out and live your life so to speak but it's a privilege to be out right now whether we go into another national lockdown now is a question but we all know whether you're this is probably the scariest time of a lot of people's lives a lot of uncertainty pain and confusion yeah i get it people need to survive businesses need to survive people need to put food in their mouths but since when was money more precious to us than human lives? But there is one thing I know for sure. We all have one thing in common now. We were all locked down into our houses at one point. 
so we can all have empathy for each other. And that, that for me, is the silver lining under all of this bullshit. Hi everyone, my name is Marisol and I'm, I, what got me inspired to write this monologue was climate change and also the transformation that our cities are going through and also colonialism. Did you notice know that when it rains, that really light rain, we see that the water is falling, but it doesn't make a noise as if it never reaches the floor. But we don't see that it's actually moving. And even though I'm alert, it suddenly disappears without me realizing. But I see the consequences. Once a man said that humans will be the only species that won't leave footprints on the earth, we're almost transformed in pixels completely. I think we won't leave footprints because there won't be any earth left to mark them. It will vanish like that rain. Things in our cities will disappear. It's happening now when we're not noticing. I've been doing this silly thing. If you look up the definition of city, you will laugh. Cambridge says a large town. Fair enough, right? Any town in the UK that has a cathedral. Well, the city is everything. It's all in it. It's all of us. It has our identity, our history, or is it that we give the city? Maybe it's a mix. You see, they told us since colonialism that a territory must be organized and exploited. They made binary separations, human, non-human, alive, dead, passive, active, you see. But the link with our landscape is part of us. The city is alive, it's moving. I dream that our future cities will be connected, but for real, not internet connected. That we will have more equal relationships among us and with non-human communities. I guess it'll depend on us because we are the cities, right? Look, it's starting to rain. Hi everyone, I'm Seth uh, and I was inspired to write this but we were all in lockdown. I was sort of thinking where will this trend of isolation and living at home lead us? I was kind of worried about a future where we don't have any public space or where we're all trapped in our own little bubbles. So I hope you enjoy it. So I'm still getting used to this. Uh, so what, you, you want me to just talk about it? Okay, well, I've heard, lived on the state all my life, so I thought it might be nice for my rent to actually go somewhere instead of just to the government. I mean, you never see that cash again, do you? Yeah. So I thought, time for a change, yeah? And I mean, it was nice to start. Yeah, every month I was paying off my mortgage. God, I never thought I'd say that. Plus, when they, when they doled them all out, all the public parts, I was pretty lucky. You know, I got, I think I got prime real estate. Some grass next to swimming pools in Hampstead Heath. Bunch of posh twats just sat in my land for hours, paying me to have a picnic. It was mint. I was, but then, I mean, on the other hand, I mean, our breaks on site were a bit shit because you can't really sit down for like a pasty for more than five minutes before you get a buzz on your phone. <laughs> And then you just start paying some ponds from Tunbridge Wells. Like it just comes out of your account. And then autumn came. I mean, it started pissing down every single day. And nobody wanted to go for picnics anymore. So <clears throat> suddenly our contract just ended and I was unemployed. Still am. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fine. I get my job center checks. I'm, I'm paying off my, my mortgage, but... Can't find a job and I can't work from home. Like, I mean, what am I supposed to do? Lay bricks on fucking Zoom? But living in London right now, it's kind of like, I mean, you, you ever like play right till the end in Monopoly? And so, like, every space is owned by somebody, and every move you make, you, you just, you might just, all your money gone. And now, even queuing is nerve wracking. Like, 
like you you'd think if there was one thing that that's sacred in the uk it's it's that so but this is going out to america yeah okay cool um well if you keep any of this in i want you to keep this bit in. <laughs> just let them know that if these bastards ask you if you want to vote to split up all your public land between every citizen you tell them to piss off back to dragon's den Hi, my name's Sam. Um, I wrote this monologue um, when I was thinking about Port Talbot and living um, with a sealworks behind my house. Sometimes I look out my bedroom window and see the steelworks behind my house. Doesn't that look horrible, some say. I'd hate to live there, others point out. But I see it different. I see the beauty in it, how it lights up at night, looking like a city skyline. It's wonderful. The place is like a city in a small town and it has its purpose. It helps build the buildings of the future and the bridges to get us there. And it sustains everyone here put food on our table. It sheltered us, sustaining generation after generation. But looking forward, I don't know what the future holds for my little town. Every day you hear about other towns just like this one being put to the wayside, lost in life's shuffle. I don't know if there's anything I can do about that. Maybe the best I can do is hope for my future town. But all I do know is that when I look out in the night sky, I see this ugly, beautiful thing. Hi, my name's Lucy. My monologue is inspired by community and gentrification and people kind of being pushed out. Have you got any snacks? Haven't eaten anything all day? Well, since lunchtime. <laughs> I went to that new cafe on the high road. All right food, but bloody expensive. And the menus were on these weird little clipboards. James got a black coffee, guess how much it was? No, go on, guess. Four pounds. Four. <laughs> you would have had a bloody heart attack if I'd taken you there. I'll walk over to the chippy later if you want, yeah? I nearly got run over today. Don't you look at me like that. I nearly got run over today by an electric scooter. <laughs> My God, wouldn't that be an embarrassing way to go? <laughs> you could give them a run for your money, set out some cones down the bus lane and you'll be off in your mobility thingy. <laughs> Seriously though, I just don't understand the need. People are constantly looking for new ways to avoid walking our streets. We'll do anything, spend anything to avoid the possibility of human interaction. Because God forbid they had to say hi to Edith from next door, who has been living here since before she was even born. At least on the bus, there's a sense of like, silent community sharing the painful awkwardness of, I don't know, that time on the W3 after Grandad's memorial. We sat in silence for a while. <laughs> then this kid gets on and accidentally plays his music out loud. <laughs> and the whole bus is filled with the sound of Britney Spears opening notes to Oops, I Did It Again. <laughs> We needed that. This remains ours because we choose to be seen and to take up space. You will not be replaced by high rise buildings and office blocks and coffee shops and fucking juice bars. Sorry for swearing then. Hi, I'm Rishane. I wrote this piece 
it was inspired by the events of 2020 and how it created so much uncertainty about our futures. We all started this year going in the same direction. We counted down and then we set off. Some people sprinting until they couldn't catch their breath. Others walking along, admiring the scenery. And some people not even trying. It was easy, it was taken for granted. Until we came face to face with the cliff. Some of us knew about it before others. Some of us chose not to believe about the cliff, but either way it doesn't matter anymore because we can all see it now. We can all feel the wind in our hair, taste the salty air on our tongues, and now we realize we're teetering on the edge and most of us are barely standing up. And as we stand on this cliff, we find ourselves looking out, resting our eyes upon the horizon. The horizon that's so dazzling, with all its pinks and blues and oranges. So dazzling, you could get lost in it and forget for a moment that you're not really sure if the sun is rising or setting. So we look down and we find an ocean, but it's a dangerous and treacherous ocean. An ocean that churns so vigorously, it's almost as if it's full of hate and anger. It's almost as if it wouldn't even need jaws to open us up, open up and swallow us whole. So we take a step back. Maybe if we go backwards, but there's a fire burning in the distance. And it's as angry as the ocean beneath us and as hateful as it was. So it's destroying everything in its path. Everything we had, everything we worked for, it's gone. We just stand there watching the fire dancing in and around the carnage as if dancing on somebody's grave. And now we realize that there's nowhere for us to go. Both the fire and the ocean are getting angrier by the second. The ocean is beating at the cliff's walls and the fire is practically sprinting towards us. But maybe we could run across the cliff's edge. Except we can't because the ground is uneven and ever changing and it's impossible to take a short step. And even if we could, the wind has picked up speed and is aggressively rushing between us as we stumble and we fall. And we've realised now that this is it. That the next steps we take, if we take any at all, are crucial. This is the future we feared. This is the future we were reluctant to speak about. So now it's surrounded us with its anger and its hate. Almost vengeful at being ignored. Now we have to choose whether we can or we want to. Because if we don't choose now, who knows what will happen next? Hi, I'm Daniel, um, and I wrote this monologue inspired by uh, like the digital world and the world that we occupy in, in, in reality. They've added a subway line of Verdansk. You can get from the airport to the shopping district in five minutes, given that there's nothing blocking the train line, of course. I decided to see it for myself the other week. Flew in with three randoms. Can't even remember their names now. I think one of them was called Sniper Nade or something like that. They seemed to want to see it just as much as I did. So that's the first place we landed. I mean, I knew as soon as I took my first steps onto the platform that I was going to get shot, but part of me just thought that everyone would want to see it, you know? At least I got to see it a little bit, lying on the floor, bleeding. 45 seconds till the game decides that I'm probably not getting back up and kicks me out of the spectator menu. I crawled around, trying to work out where I would go for the next time when the revive animation started playing. The sniper nade came to get me. He had landed miles away, probably doing a recon mission or something, but he came to get me. The existential significance from the kindness of this digital stranger hadn't quite set in yet. Virtual me needed assistance, and I got it. We didn't win the game in the end. I played one more game with three more randoms, then went to bed. Anyway, I was waiting for the bus from town today, and I was on my phone, as is custom to waiting. But the reason I mentioned that was because so was the girl next to me. The bus took a little bit long to arrive, so I decided to walk to the next bus stop and get it there. And as I was walking, I checked for my wallet and it was gone. I looked back to where I was sitting at the bus stop and there it was. And I don't know what made me do this, but I decided to keep walking, even though I knew my wallet wasn't in my pocket anymore. And I looked back one more time 
And I saw the girl notice it. And I got all excited. I thought, what am I going to say when she steals it? If she shouts back at me, that would be spontaneous. If she runs after me, if she calls after me, how am I going to respond? I didn't know. But I didn't need to answer any of those questions. Because she looked at it, then looked back at her phone. She looked, saw a wallet that was obviously mine, then responded to a text. The moral dilemma of whether or not to return my wallet didn't even cross her mind. So when I realised that I was neither going to have to confront or thank this girl, I picked it back up. And I suppose that's what happened today. Today, I dropped my wallet and I picked it back up. My physical self needed assistance and I didn't get it. There was nothing new about the place we were in or the, the dilemma the girl faced. In fact, she'd probably been faced with that same choice for, for hundreds, of, hundreds of times. And she got bored. She got bored of only having to choose two options, so she chose not to choose. And it's the only unique interaction I've seen in months. That's why I'm not angry she didn't return it. I suppose I just wish that when I decided to test the girl's morality, a man flew in from a plane in the sky and handed me it. I'd see above his head that he was called something stupid like sniper nade, and I wouldn't have to realise that I'm bored of waking up in the morning. Hi, my name's Sarah, and this monologue is inspired by some of the issues going on in the world. I've been asked to talk about the future. Well, the thing is, I'm unsure where to start. The future seems so bleak. We're told to be grateful. Logistically, I have equal rights and the rights of others are also improving, but this is not what I see. Every day I am harassed over and over by cruel words of men as I walk by. Lift up your skirt, they say. Show us your tits, they say. I'm told the way I pronounce certain words sounds stupid and unladylike. I'm told to always be nice, even when some people are never nice to me. The future seems so bleak when only 1.7% of accused rapists receive any jail time in the UK. The future seems so bleak when a police car has more rights than a human being, and when the colour of one's skin determines their value. I've been asked to talk about the future, but what future? When the world has seven years, seven, before it's uninhabitable. Fossil fuels are burnt, animals are killed, and the air is polluted. You've asked me to talk about the future, when homeless people beg on the streets. Immigrants die crossing borders only for those who do make it to be mistreated. And all the while I still fight for everyone's future and for a future that I don't even know if I'll have. I feel like I'm drowning, like the ground could swallow me up and I fight and I fight and for what? To be grilled for working a man's job, for not being smart enough, attractive enough, rich enough. You say we have equal rights, yet when my friend is attacked, there's nothing that can be done. When a black person is murdered, it's their fault for not complying. When the earth is dying, there's just small changes we can all make. When immigrants die crossing borders, it's because they shouldn't have left their country. And when homeless people freeze to death on the streets, well, they should have gotten a job. You've asked me to talk about the future, but the future seems so bleak. Um, hi, my name is Georgina. Um, my monologue is basically about um, perceptions of the city, particularly um, in the year of COVID and just um, kind of migration into and out of the city and ultimately the search for happiness. So yeah, hope you enjoy. When I was a child, I used to watch videos from the archives with my grandmother. She would show me all sorts of programs from decades ago, 
programs that first aired back when she was a child. There was this one documentary series that really interested me. It was about different people from all around the world. Each one had made the decision to retreat from mainstream society and live in a deserted location somewhere in the world. A lot of people didn't understand why they left. They couldn't see the logic in giving up the benefits of an urban lifestyle for a life of solitude in the wilderness. Life in the city was all they ever knew. That's all I've ever known. All my life, I've followed the rules of the city. I've gone from A to B to C to D in the hope that when I finally get to Z, all my hard work would finally pay off. But as time goes on, I'm beginning to think that the universe doesn't work that way. I follow the rules and things don't work out, or I follow the rules and they do, but it takes an insane amount of energy to get there. I used to wonder why it has to be this way. But now I wonder if it has to be this way at all. Then I remember the people in the documentaries I used to watch with grandmother. And that's why I'm considering leaving the city for good. Although I'm not sure if I should. What if I leave and I feel the same way there as I do here? What if I can't adapt? I've lived here my entire life. It's all I've ever known. What if things don't work out for me there, but I can't get back here anymore? And despite everything, I still hold on to the hope that one day, someday, all that I have done here will pay off. I've invested my entire life into making something of myself here. If I leave, then everything that I've done so far would be for nothing. But if I don't leave, then I'll never know what it's like to be out there. I'll be stuck here for a lifetime and I'll never have the chance to leave again. The gates will be closing soon. So I have to make my decision quickly, but I'm scared of making the wrong decision. I'm scared of making a mistake. Hiya, I'm Christy Koo. And uh, we all need some clean air, so this is Bubble Boost. Thanks so much for coming down. You can just pop your oxygen pack under your chair. Yes, the air quality index averaged at 500 this week. Horrible. Now we'll just run over the basics before we get your signature and deposit. Okay. So with Bubble Boost, we have free membership tiers and you're going for the gold, which we love to see. Gold gets you 24 hours access to our facilities and you can sleep overnight for a maximum of seven nights per month. You have an unlimited number of breath classes and for normal sessions, you can just pop in for a 10 minute boost, a half hour detox or a one hour deep cleanse, just book online. Now we believe in creating a fully immersive experience. So it's like being anywhere in the world without having to use up our precious travel rations or risking sky bandits or any of that nonsense like that. You can choose the scenery and of course our famous scents. Yes it does. Our membership gets you access to everything, all the pre-made scents and packages and you can make your own combination. Now your membership does add positive points to your health insurance so make sure you show your company that you're taking care of yourself. Oh, don't worry, the air, is one, the air is from one of our premium pockets of countryside. Uh, the exact location is classified information now. Uh, we provide a world-class service. Our customer satisfaction rates are the highest in the country and our retention rates are exceptional. Everyone needs a breath of fresh air, so. You know, it's quite hard to get a membership here. We run extensive background checks on all applicants. You were all cleared, of course. We're no trouble at all, right? Now, unless you have any further questions, you can just sign here and just tap your wrist here to pay. Perfect, amazing. Welcome to Bubble Booths.
Hi, my name is Anna, and my monologue's based on looking at London through the eye of someone that's been kicked out of their lifelong home due to gentrification. London is where my dad propped me up on my first neon pink bike and coached me to pedal faster, faster, spraying the autumn leaves along the cracked pavement, puffing and sweating until my wobbles had stemmed enough to take off my stabilizers. It's where I chased my giddy little sisters around the scuff scruffy garden, hurling them into the icy paddling pool to the roaring backdrop of jumbo jet planes navigating their way into Heathrow. <laughs> London is where my brother and I scooped up extra snow from the road to add an inch to the tallest snowman our street had ever seen. It's the sunny afternoons I spent with my mum at the allotment, growing grapevines and strawberries, just pretending we were someplace more exotic. London, London is is the laughter and, and the shrieks of schoolgirls cramming into the after-school bus. It's the rusty swing set that, <laughs> though it doesn't look like much, bathes in moonlight every night and holds the secret of my first kiss. <laughs> London is ours. <sighs> but they're taking it. Property developers are slithering their way in, eyeing up the cracked pavements and rusty swing set, seeing them as eyesores rather than treasure chests. They look at me and my baby sister and her friends circling the block on their BMXs and see a threat rather than a group of bustling, exciting kids learning TikTok dances. They coil their way around our town, looking for the best spots to be gentrified. What can be polished? What can get demolished? And worst of all, who can be abolished? Because as much as the government wants to invest in making London bright, clean and sparkly, there's a cost to this. And the cost is us. Families who got a mortgage on these homes in the 80s and 90s before the sky prices skyrocketed. Families who couldn't really afford to live here, but their parents worked two jobs to pay off the debts. These parents had children who went to school, who fell in love, who built a life here. Children who now can never afford to stay. Our streets will be gentrified for people with bigger salaries, people who are viewed as more important than us, who will knock down our walls mark that marked how tall we were and whitewash them into a clean, empty canvas, leaving no trace of us. The future of our city because that will no longer be ours. Hi, I'm Daisy, and my monologue is inspired by just being on the tube. I'm getting that tube feeling. It's late, but not too late, just late enough that an orange haze grows. I've just got on and thank God been able to sit down. In fact, the tube's basically empty a rare occurrence for the 612 Piccadilly line to Heathrow. The orange skies demand your undivided attention as I wander out the window. Did you know the average tube only goes around 20 miles an hour? It's crazy. It feels quicker and slower at the same time. I sit and I think how everyone on the tube has their own life and their own future and maybe at some point our paths will intertwine and we'll never know that we sat on the tube together, connected, at least for a stop. I mean, like we're only six people away from everyone in the world. And that just blows my mind. And then these eyes look up and I smile. It's my instant reaction hidden by the mask on my face. I look away, I look up, I look away. I look again just to see if he's looking too. I look away, I look up and it's stupid, I know, but I don't care. And just as I've started planning the wedding, he gets off. Doesn't matter, I'll never see him again. It doesn't matter that he couldn't see me smiling, yet for some strange reason, unbeknownst to me, I feel sad. I mean, it's just the everyday heartbreak, isn't it? And it just keeps getting darker and darker until only I can see the moon in the sky. And if I look really closely, I can kind of see the stars in the sea of light pollution. And it's at this moment, like everything's built up to it, I realize a complete and utter insignificance. Like to me, in my life, yeah, I'm special. 
But to the universe, I'm a star, completely unique, but just a face in the crowd. I get off, and as the cold, crisp air hits the back of my throat, I realize that everything about the tube journey has already been forgotten. Until next time. So, you know that feeling when you're on the tube and it's late and you're deliriously waiting to get home? I think that every day will feel like that. Hiya, my name's Miriam and my monologue is very loosely inspired by an iconic family member who tells the most amazing but not always accurate stories. The future of our cities lies between the cracked pavement slabs. It's in the sewage. It's the rat's tail. It's the ripped plastic bag drifting aimlessly through the wind. It's the chipped cement, the solemn traffic warden. It's the running engine of a car not moving. It's the baby's cry from across the street. I used to think it was more than that. I used to think it rained for a reason. But it doesn't. It just rains. <laughs> Grandma was the sunset, the final light of a dim and dark horizon. She used to smoke a really long cigar that protruded from her face like some sort of grotesque smoky finger. I was fascinated by the curling paper, the embers swirling and illuminating her crinkled cheek. The smoke rose with the hot air in the room. Every day I'd go round and she'd tell me stories, her stories. How she'd once eaten at the Ritz. <laughs> how the chandeliers dripped with gold instead of wax. <laughs> how, how she'd stuffed 50 finger sandwiches into her pockets for safekeeping. <sighs> how she'd felt tingly all the way home. One of my favourites was the story about Mr Hines, the greengrocers down the road. He had whiskers rather than a moustache and teeth instead of lips. <laughs> he was grandma's worst enemy. She told me they'd once had a run-in when he accused her of stealing two limes and one lemon from the shop. She gave him a firm biff on the nose and left with three limes and two lemons. She never spoke to him again. She once wrestled a monkey at the zoo because it tried to steal her purse. She yelled, not on my watch, Buster! And the monkey was christened Buster on the spot. She went once a year to visit him to check he was behaving himself. I hung on to every word. It was my gospel. She was my way out of walls that didn't sleep, of food that had no taste, of parents who couldn't afford perfume of any other scent than betrayal. It wasn't until she died two months ago that mum told me the truth. Apparently, they couldn't bear to tell me when I doted on her so much. But none of it was true. None of it. She never went to the Ritz. She used the different greengrocers because it was cheaper. The trip to Budapest was a surgery. Buster was her yearly medical. The smoke in the kitchen was from her cigar, not the fire she put out with her bare hands. No director offered her a ticket to Hollywood but because he said she had eyes the world needed to see. Turns out I was the only one who couldn't see. I'm a sales manager now. I have a flat. And a future. I've worked really hard to climb out of the hole I was born into because of her. Who even calls their grandmother grandma anyway? 
Shouldn't it be Nana? She once told me that the future of our cities rests on the shoulders of the young. So after all, after all this, after everything, I've just realized that I never really left that council estate. <laughs> What's really bothering me is that I really should have guessed about the fire. There were no burns on her hands. Hiya, uh, my name is Alex uh, and my monologue is inspired by self-isolation and the climate change protests of late. I used to be able to walk up Kilburn High Road on a Saturday evening. Can't believe I'm romanticising Kilburn High Road, but <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd walk up it. Past the Earl of Derby, where I had a trial shift once and didn't go back. Where a man told me never to go further than the second Woody Grill or I get stabbed. Past Spicy Basil, the best Thai place in London. Though I've, I've not actually been anywhere else to test that theory. <laughs> and finally up to the medical center. That's where I'd stop because if you timed it right, the sun had bounced back off the top floor windows and cast an orange glow on the street beneath my feet. <laughs> Rhymes. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'd stop there and just take a minute to listen. You'd mainly hear cars and indistinct chatter in languages I don't speak in that, but those were the sounds I first heard when I came here. That's what I fell in love with. So I would listen and breathe in exhaust fumes and stare right into London's beating heart. But they've blocked it all off now. The high road, all the way up to Wealth Street. I've not been allowed out for 17 days. <laughs> Apparently it's too dangerous. They're trying to get down to Marble Arch, down through Maida Vale. They're getting closer though, but still got a long way to go. And I think the silence is starting to get to me. I mean, I support the cause, I do, because someone's got to do something, otherwise we'll all end up underwater. But I just want to hear those sounds again. Those sounds are what made this city. They were made up of transport and people and buildings. And if they could talk, we'd have some stories, but I don't even know if those buildings are still there now. I guess not. And all I've got is this silence. And that don't make this city. Hello, my name is Isabel Haig and I'm performing a monologue that is in response to the question, why would you want to be Prime Minister? Not for like fixing fences and building car parks, I want to do it for people, innit? I want to do it for kids like me, for detention lovers and attention seekers, for the kid that turns up the volume to Hurt by Johnny Cash and for kids that turn up to school in the middle of the day without a wash. For kids that have to pack their life into two bags at half past one and only visit Nan's house when all the food in the house is gone. For mums and dads that haven't got money and for money and kids that are the bane of their life. Kids that think they're ugly and don't get told they're not. Lasses that think they're in love and lads that want to love and then kids that I'd really love to be loved because it's a smell of mucky houses or my mucky home. And the sight of policemen in early hours at morning is I want to know where my mother might be. And it's trying to cook and serve dinner loud enough to cover the sound of that exact mother crying in the bedroom. And she's my mum, you know. Not a mother, my mum. And it's not my home either. It's got the shapes, it's got the rooms, it's got a fridge and a bath and a bed just big enough. But it's brown and beige and dirty. It's an house, not my home. And of course, this is all for Billy No Mates. Because... It's for bedroom walls with holes and little hands and broken knuckles. 
and odd bods it's the weirdos they always get picked last the lad that lives at number four and the bus stop girl with no name little yellow fingers and ciggy stained teeth for home time at 1am and breathing into your mum's sad little face on repeat and is that not enough eh what you want more and what's that then is it clanging chimes or piles of endless green? Is it never been to a funeral or I lived out my dream? Is it talking to your best mates and growing old and happy? Or is it packing up fucking off and making a name for your sen? Is it dossing off football practice because you've got better things to do? Or drinking at a pub to laugh past two because who even bloody cares? I don't. It's a funny old dangerous game, that. I don't care. Did you hear me? Mum. Funny, funny, dangerous game for kids who sleep in courts and share a bed with their brothers and sisters. For kids who steal food from school and for kids who get asked, why is your house so small? For ketchup sandwiches and sitting on the pavement playing with cement. For why is he always up to something and why is he always in bother? And he got something better to do. But have you seen the state of his mother? Yeah, that nameless mother who never took her kids to butlings and never took them abroad or put cheap icing and sprinkles on digestive biscuits with them. And it's that mother, that very mother, my mother, yeah, who has made a pretty big mess of herself, hasn't she? The mother I hear you talking about as she wandered streets at Daft Cock because the kid's gone missing again. And can you blame them? Can you blame them, kids? This is for them, kids. This is, and I'm going to I'm gonna be more. I'll, I'll make you proud. And this is for them, kids, this is for kids like me. Every time I'm home, I long for the city. And every time in the city, I want to return home. A foot in each side, it's like this circle. It spins faster and faster until one day I don't think I belong anywhere. Sometimes I'm in the city so long, I forget how the grass feels beneath my feet. I don't see the sunrise or the pink streaked skies. I leave the door with headphones on, a polite way to abstain from human connection. At home, I'd smile at strangers and shout morning across the street. The city is a way out, an excuse, a get out clause, and I'm busy, shouted at an event you wish to avoid, a family gathering you fear to attend. A grandparent you fear to see because they are no longer who you remember. No longer the person who would peel you apples or cook you porridge in the morning. No longer the person you'd watch the chase with in the evening. But now there are no excuses. There is no city, no job, no distractions. Just time. I visited family. And I found the person I feared to see is still the person I love and who loves me. I sit in the room and peel the apples and cook the porridge she used to make me. I watch repeats of the chase. I listen to her tell me how she met my granddad for the 20th time. At night, I lie awake and I think of the city. I think of how I have been given this time to be home. When I close my eyes, I dream of home now, of rolling fields and rows of trees, of my family, my city. I do not claim to know the future of cities. I do not know what challenges are ahead of us, but I do know that nothing is going anywhere anytime soon. Hello, I'm Rosa and my monologue is of a taxi driver observing the city, um, one that's a growing city and uh, sharing his observations with the passenger. Hi, mate, is it? Yeah, great. Do you want me to put your bags in there? Oh, no worries. And you're going to, yeah, thanks. Been anywhere nice? Been anywhere, yeah. Oh, lovely. I went there when I was younger with my mates. Thought I'd end up back there at some point, to be honest. Great city, though. You know, it's one of the best places in Europe for people with, uh, you know, physical disabilities. For wheelchairs, Zimmer frames, like smooth 
pavements, not like here, dips and potholes everywhere, barely anywhere to cross. You know, my daughter struggled. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. It, it can be a bit busy around there at this time. I oh, was going to cut down Charles Street. Oh, yeah, no worries. Gotcha. How long were you away for then? Oh, hang on, sorry. Didn't know this road was closed. Construction <laughs> all over the bloody city centre. I'll try Oldham Street, is that all? Yeah, cool. What do you do then? Wow, do you work down on? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Fancy place. <laughs> 11 quid to get a pint near there, mind you. <gasps> Fuck's sake. Sorry, how do you even get out of here? You know, all these, these cranes, these new buildings, who the fuck are they for? I'll try down here, sorry about this. But you know, there's so many people with, with nothing. All these headlines saying how bad homelessness is getting. I mean, yeah, I can see it. People with absolutely nothing. And they're already on the street not doing jobs before then, like this poor guy out here, cleaning windows at traffic lights. These guys come out of a van at 5 a.m. and are just left here. Picked up later, I guess. I've seen it, trafficking. That's what it is, human trafficking. And nothing is getting better. All of these, you know, fuck, fuck, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> just another roadblock. Did you say Charles Street? Yeah, that's fine. Hi, I'm Michael. And this one log was inspired by a lack of sleep and deadline pressure. Are you scared of me? I used to be scared in the dark. Thought there were monsters or bad people there. Not bad as attractive, but bad as in evil. I'm not a refugee. Sorry, random. I just thought I'd let you know, tell you. I was born in this country. So school, we sang about Jesus, assemblies and spring chickens at Easter. I'm a spring chicken. Yeah, they're on sprout. Da -da 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 I guess you don't know it. It's a shame. It's a real shame. I fancied this girl that used to do ballet and then I started doing dance as well to impress her. Didn't work out. Dance did, but the point is, I'm not here to destroy the West. Yes, I know, random. It's just, it's on my mind. Someone described it to me that Western cities are like Rome. These great empires built off war, blood, guts, gore. And that over time, Rome grew complacent and was destroyed. But then it was taken over by barbarians. Now, I'm not saying that's what's happening now to the West, but it's just, there's a lack of opportunity and nowhere to go. And I don't think any of my friends could work more than 40 hours a week, let alone go to war. I'm not Muslim. Sorry, just thought I'd clean the air, tell you that. Not that there's a problem with that or an issue or anything wrong. It. It's just people can be funny, really funny. I've got a chocolate bar in my bag if you want it. It's been in there a couple of days, but it's still good. <laughs> you know what they say? Beggars can't be choosers. Oh my goodness, I think I speak for everyone when I say each and every piece was amazing. I felt I know I can't, it was indescribable watching every piece. Well done to everyone who performed tonight. Um, this was part of, firstly, I want to thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. This is part of the Made by Members Festival. Um, this is the last show today, but if you forgot to catch other ones live, it's totally fine. They're on the website, they're on the channel. So if you click on the channel, you can watch them all. Um, once again, thank you for tuning in. And once again, thank you to everyone who performed. Well done.